Praise the Lord. Praise My topic today is listening incarnationally. Listening incarnationally. Listening incarnationally is listening like Jesus did. God became incarnate when he took human form as Jesus. Even at the point of the cross, Jesus experienced a humanly low position. Yet Jesus still humbly listened with his heart to fulfill the promises of God. Listening to what people say and feel by God's grace to what people say and feel by God's grace they experience the presence of God through us. It's leaving our comfort zone in order to meet people where they are. Amen. Receiving revelation. Switch. Okay, good, okay. It's, it's leaving our comfort zone in order to meet people where they are. Receiving revelation. James 1 and 19 talks about being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. How to listen effectively. It requires communication, understanding, compassion, empathy, and respect. How can we communicate and build relationships with no understanding? Communication in person, when you listen incarnationally, it's in person. It's communication in person when you're talking one to another. Because when you communicate, you cannot assume, first of all, as we talked about earlier. You can't avoid. You can't give the silent treatment because it won't work. Lack of communication causes a host of problems. And in order to be able to communicate, you can't just talk. You have to listen. Listen, this is a huge part of communication. Absolutely. Understanding considers, consider listening to understand and not listen to reply, That's good. but to gain insight That's good. as well as body language. When you're listening and you're talking to someone and you can tell by the body language that they're using where their conversation kind of is going, mm -hmm. if they get ruffled or if they moving or if they antsy or if they, you know, you can tell when it's going and it's not for us to put, as they would say, salt in the wound. <laughs> but if you would, we would use love in our listening. Mm -hmm. it, speaks, it speaks volumes when you can just be able to listen in a conversation and receive what a person is saying and how they're feeling Amen. and add love to that. Listening to understand how to attack things. When you listen, you can also hear from God while the person is speaking. And God can download things into you. You have to care. Compassionate is caring, having compassion. Even to go to try to settle out a, comp, uh, 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 a conversation or something that's bothering you or to, with another person, you have to go in love. You have to care how they feel. It's all a part of the love that's in us from Christ. 
It is just as important to God to bring healing to their situation, just as important as our own situations. So how can we want more from God and we give less to his people? Just like in in Philippians 2 and 4 talks about not looking on our own interests, but for each of us to look on the interests of others. And in Galatians 4, I mean 5 and 14, it speaks about the loving your neighbor as yourself. In Galatians 6 and 2, carrying each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the laws of Christ. So take your mind off yourself and penetrate your thoughts and your concern and your love into the others, Amen. into our brothers and sisters. Yes. You know, even when God is, when we are talking to somebody and we're listening to what they have to say, sometimes we be consumed in what yes. we're saying and or we have the answer for this and we already know what we're going to say. We're just waiting for them to finish so we can get it in. Or, or we cut them off. Or we, you know, we just want to get our point across. You know, and even, even if it's not something that you're combating with them, even if it's something that you can help them with, but they just need somebody to listen. Like I had a situation where I had a client and she was just talking. Just, you know how sometimes you talk, you're doing hair and you just, they rambling on. And you just listening and grinning and all. So, but at that time, I had something going on in my own life, and I wasn't, you know, really into what she was saying. Yeah, I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. So, because um, I had some things that was in the forefront of my life that I wanted God to do, and I was, and I heard the Spirit say, "Ask her about her father." And I said, "Lord." You heard what I, well, I've been praying to you for the last couple of weeks. And you, you know, <laughs> get your mind off yourself, you know. So I humbled myself, put myself completely out the way. And I said, Lord, you set it up, of course, and he always do. <laughs> Made a way so that I could ask. And, and then she just, just opened up to a place where she was hurting. And that as I was listening the Lord was downloading in me to what needed to be said to her. So it's very important to listen and not to be talking so much. Some of us have so much to say, and you can't even pay us to pay attention. (laughs) Some of us (laughs) have so much to say, and you couldn't pay us to pay attention. But, uh, but who are we helping? Who are we helping? We are here for our brothers and for our sisters. That's why the Lord placed us here. We have a job to do. It's not about us. We have to give out, give out, give out. Constantly um, thinking about giving out. Because the Lord is not going to leave us unequipped. He's going to pour into us. As we give out. So it's a constant process. So we need to do away with things that stop us from listening. Or even want to have a conversation with other people. Like distractions. And so busy wanting to say what we want to say. Giving bad counsel. Or just judging people how we feel like they are. or, or, Or talking to someone and putting God's putting um, our words in God's mouth, things that God didn't say, rushing God's process, just talking too much and manipulating the conversations. Allow God, the God, allow God to be able to humble you and listen and silence you to be able to listen to, to what needs to be dealt with at hand. Building our emotional healthy relationship should transform us to move from sympathy to empathy and from compassion to respect. Amen. 
And that puts us in the, to the point that I would call intercession in person. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12 says, It was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except for the person's own spirit. No one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, yeah. not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Amen. Amen. And when you, when, you, when, when you hear people say intercession, I say intercession, people think, of course, intercessory prayer, which is powerful, of course. But I call listening incarnation intercession in person because it places God's heart into a pacific situation. We must minister God's heart to people at their place of hurt, confusion, and pain and be effective. And we only can be effective when we're doing it God's way, when we're listening like Jesus did. Mother Teresa had a quote. This one stuck out to me the most when she said, we can cure physical diseases with medicine. But the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. Amen. Love brings incarnation alive. And it causes our relationships to become healthier. When there's love in our hearts, no agenda set up already. Just, just want, want to know what a person is feeling and genuinely care about how they're feeling, and want them to be delivered, want them to be set free, want them to be made whole. That is our job. That's our job. Hallelujah. Placing ourself in the gap to experience empathy and respect in the lives of others. Empathy defined in this text is explaining and sharing the same feelings of another. So it's listening connecting with your feelings, acknowledge the person's pain, and then show love. Respect is allowing the suffering of people you've met shape the way you live. Respect is allowing the suffering of people we've met shape the way we live. How? We learn from them. We learn from these situations, and we apply them to our life and in every situation. Everything we go through that can affect us or affect others, we can, we, what the Lord downloads in us, we learn it, and then we start to live it throughout our life in everything that we do. Respect recognizes that we understand our obligation to other people our obligation to other people. Because in, um, what's that? Um, Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, close yourself, clothe yourself with righteousness and love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your heart. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ, let the message about Christ in all its riches fill our lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives. Sing hymns and songs and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a reputation, rep representation of the Lord Jesus. 
giving thanks through him in God the Father. Now in closing, here's a listening parable. The key to understanding Jesus' parable of the sower are his final words. Whosoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. Jesus wants us to know God is sowing his word into the world and the most important posture we can have in life is that of attentive listening. God bless you. Awesome revelation. Awesome revelation. And uh, she finished a minute early. <laughs> I think she did. And, uh, and that, was, that was so powerful. I just wanted to say this because it was something, I'm thinking it happened last night that God began to show me. Um, no, it was yesterday. About uh, It was someone I met when I was talking to. And they had a religious spirit. And I, used to, and I was talking to them. They couldn't hear me. Even in the past, before I met, I said, well, Lord, when they come, please give them, let, let them be able to hear. Uh, but it was worse instead of better. And I was like, wow, that is something. And then he began to bring back to me that with the measure you meet, it'll be measured back unto you. And with the attentiveness you give to the word is what you receive from the word. And he began to uh, minister to me that people with religious spirits can't hear. He said they can't hear. And, and that's why the scribes and Pharisees and all these uh, religious leaders, they, they couldn't get with the program, right? And man, when you were talking, um, I, I just want to encourage us guys, listen, um, we, have to, we have to make sure, you know, it's not just in counseling, but in every aspect that we can hear, that we're in a position to be able to hear, because Jesus kept saying that over and over and over again, he that have ears to hear, let it, well, he won't talk about these. He, he was just about a position of the heart. And, and if we're going to talk to people, if we're going to deal with people, if we're going to do all these things we've been talking about, we must have ears to hear. Otherwise, we'll only hear ourselves. And that's what you told us. We'll only hear ourselves. And uh, maybe this was the moment he wanted me to share that. But, um, but this is why it starts with us. You know, it all starts with us, okay? So, amen. That was awesome. Angela, before you start, you see on this on page 11, these are feeling words. These are words that we need to learn when we are communicating with people or when com people are communicating with us. A lot of these words we don't express. We don't come in contact with our feelings. We don't really understand what we're feeling. So these feeling words is there for us to help locate what our feelings really are, okay? So that through, through this, we can kind of go to God and say, God, I am feeling anxious. Why am I feeling anxious? Or why am I feeling com uh, uncomfortable? You know, mm -hmm. so just take a moment and study the feeling words. Not today, but I'm <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sit down right there. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Believe it or not, I need y'all praying for me as I get ready to uh, talk about climbing the ladder of integrity. Um, because I was held to 16 minutes. <laughs> so I need to walk in integrity and do this in 16 minutes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I got my timer going. Amen. It says, uh, climbing the ladder of integrity. The introduction is, we are all products of who we think we are. Who we think we are has been cultivated over time by the conditioning from our perspective, um, excuse me, from our respective spheres of influence. Those influencers are most likely our family, peers, friends, bosses, churches, government, and even media. We have often been told to be who we are not more so than who we are. This has led us to a crisis of not knowing who we are authentically. We have heaped up for ourselves teachers that tell us how to look, act, and perform. Oftentimes we are left empty and wanting because uh, we are afraid to scream, I don't know who I am which is a true statement when you're not connected to the great I am. The questions we still long to answer is, who do men say that I am? 
Who do my friends and family say that I am? And who am I? Hallelujah. We get caught up in what our reputations are, and we get caught up with how we want to be perceived. But who are we authentically? Yes. Amen. Yes. Climbing the ladder of integrity. Let me tell you what integrity is. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. It's also the state of being whole and undivided. In Matthew 16, verses 13 through 15, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people, the community, say the Son of Man is? Now listen to what he asked them. He didn't say who they said I am like I told us to do. He says who they say the Son of Man is. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, my close personal friends, he asked. Who do you say I am? Now, did you get that? He made that leap from who do they say the son of man is. Now, who do you say that I am? In other words, he's letting them know right then who he was. Amen. See, he was already telling them who he was, but only one caught on to it when he said it, and that was Peter. Yes, Amen? Yes, I'm going to find my place. And then it says, um, he says, uh, Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, jo uh, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. All right, and then that brings me to this point. But who do you say that you are? Who do you say that you are? Now ask your neighbor, look at one another, and say, who are you really? Who are you really? Mm -hmm. Your response will start with, now y'all mess with my time now. Y'all mess with my time. Look. <laughs> We gotta fit. We're gonna we're gonna work this out. We're gonna work this out. All right. Your response will start with "I am." Now remember, Jesus or God Himself is the great "I am." Amen. And so that means that we are just a, 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 a smaller version or a lesser version than the great "I am." We are the less "I am," I guess we could say. And so therefore, right there, immediately we identify that we are like God. That we are gods. But sometimes the way the enemy comes, he immediately comes to steal our identity. And therefore, we don't know that when we are even announcing ourselves to people that we are already identifying with our creator. Praise God. Amen. Amen. But this is the identity crisis. We're going to go to Genesis 3, and I'm going to read it, and you can just follow along. It says, uh, now, this because this is where the crisis began. Uh, uh, chap chapter 3 verses 1 through 13 so I'm going to be real quick so hold on alright now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made he said to the woman did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden the woman said to the serpent we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me. See, women, we've been getting a bad rep since the beginning. <laughs> she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And these are the points I want you to take away from this. There are Number one, she's talking to the devil. We are talking about an identity crisis, all right? Number one, one of the points to take away from this passage is that she's talking to the devil. Second, she was already like God. Thirdly, 
they were never to know evil, only good. For both of their eyes, spirits were now opened to sin. Number five, they realized they were naked, or for this instance, they realized now that they are uncovered. Now, number six is, they came from under the glory cloud of God when they left his presence. And number seven, now they're wanting to start to cover themselves. Eight, Adam's response to God's questions of where they were reveals where they went wrong. He said he was naked, meaning I used to be transparent. They were deceived, and as a result, we now deceive ourselves and one another. In our attempt to find out more like Eve, we took of the forbidden, except our forbidden is trying to be like someone else. God hates when we try to live out our lives under pretense. Eve was already all she needed to be. She was already like God, but the enemy made her believe she was missing something. Satan has no new strategies because the old ones are still working. <laughs> Satan tells us all that we're missing something. Not only does he have us with weaves, pushed up cleaves, injections, but that's not all. <laughs> Y'all caught it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Break it down. So, amen. <laughs> so, y'all, I'll take a break. Sorry. <laughs> he wants us to behave like others. This is Satan. He sells us the images through commercialism every day. Remember, I want to be like Mike. <clears throat> if I could be like Mike, well, if Mike ain't like Christ, amen, I only follow Mike if Mike following Christ. Amen. Our identity is a wrestle for us, Jacob before becoming Israel. Sometimes we even have to get knocked off of our high horse, Saul, to become Apostle Paul. We might have to give birth to what's inside of us, Sarah to Sarah. We have to have a revelation. We have to have a revelation of who he is to become from Simon to Peter. Amen. Amen. For you created my inmost being. This is Psalm 139, 13, and 14. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. See, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God already knew you and your innermost parts. He knew what you liked and what you disliked. He knew what you would love and what you would hate. He knew the things that would be attractive to you because that's how he made you intimately. He didn't mean for you to be made like anybody else. But what we have often done is because we are so insecure in our identity, Amen. we heap up for ourselves teachers, and teachers can come through media, teachers can come through these colleges, teachers can just be anything that would teach us, and we just kind of just put those things on them. Oh, she's got a nice personality. Let me see if I can put that on. Yeah. Oh, she's real forthcoming. Let me see if I can put that on. Oh, she doesn't like red boots, so... I won't wear any red boots. Oh, she does, She just loves to always just be so happy, happy, happy all the time. So let me see if I can fake being happy, happy, happy all the time. Let me put that on. Let me cover myself with all these things that would make me appealing to people. Let me cover myself that I might be able to please people. Right. See, but the thing was, God never intended for them to cover themselves. That's right. They were already under the covering of an almighty God. They were under that covering in the garden. And when they got from under that covering, that's when they realized they were naked. But God said, who told you you were naked? Because, see, the thing was, God knew how to cover them. He intended for them to be naked. He intended them to be naked because before him, we must be naked with whom we have every, you know, all to do. I know I didn't quote it all the way right, but I, it's in there. It's in there. See? Because in our nakedness, we're able to own up to what's really going on with us. If there's something wrong with us, we can say it. We don't have to hide it. We don't have to cover it up. We can be naked before him with whom we have to do. See? We don't have to try to cover those things up and mask our feelings. And therefore, when we mask our feelings, we mask who we are. 
And when we mask who we are, we're not truly walking in authentic integrity. Amen. 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 All right, now uh, read Psalm 139 later. That's for your own reading. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity, and in singing did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And that's Psalm 51, 5 and 6. We were not properly trained, and you taught us a few minutes ago, Miss Dorothy, that we were, the way we were trained, or we were not properly trained, was that we were taught boys don't cry. They're not supposed to feel their emotions. They're not supposed to get upset. They're, not, they're supposed to suck it up and be a man, be a man. That's what being a man is. You don't show no emotions. You keep that stuff locked up on the inside. You hide that. You suppress that. You repress that. And you wonder why they're going postal out here. They're going postal because people are not allowing people to be them, their authentic selves. And you know why they don't? Because we're not our own authentic selves. See, and because we're fake, we want everybody else to treat us Amen. Uh, according to how we present ourselves. Amen. And so because we're not authentic, people can't treat us authentically in return. And so therefore we find issues with people because the real us got a problem with the real them, but the fake us can't let them know that we got a problem with them. <laughs> see, see, the fake us, the fake us, the fake us. Church faces. Yeah. The real us can't come before one another and bear our souls with one another. And I have need of you. You have need of me. But if I'm faking it, then the thing that God has designed for you to get in me or for me to get from you and me to get from and, and you to get from me, I can't get it because you won't let it be seen. And if you won't let it be seen, then you are doing me a disservice. And if I don't allow myself to be seen, I'm doing you a disservice. We have need one of another. We have need one of another. Now, let me, let me check my time because I'm going to try to rush this on through here. Hold on. Because Deacon Charles, he probably got my clock going. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm down to two minutes. Let me real here, look real quick. Hallelujah. So I'm going to bring this in real quick. So Hallelujah. Identity crisis was healed in the garden. I'm going to go ahead and just go to this part. Uh, when Jesus was in the garden, the Bible clearly declares how he was in anguish. Jesus wasn't faking this thing. He was, he was really anguished. He was sorrowful. He was hurting. He was in pain. Hallelujah. And we think it's because of the death of the cross. No. I beg to differ. I said it was because he was getting ready to experience what they had experienced in the garden from the original. From the, uh, from the origin. They were about to experience what it was like. He was about to experience what it was like to be without the presence of God. He was about to experience what it was about to be like not to have the covering of God. He was about to experience what it was like to be fake and not to be able to be genuine before God. He was about to experience the part of him being covered with all this stuff that was not him. With all this stuff that was not him. And therefore, he could not be transparent. God asked him, who told you you were naked? You were supposed to be naked before God. You were supposed to be transparent before God. And when you can be transparent before God, you can be transparent before people. And when you can be transparent before people, we can all get healed. Yeah, Hallelujah. We can all get healed. Yes, Amen. All right, I got a minute. I'm going to bring this over here. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God already knew you. He knew you intimately. He knew your likes and dislikes, and I think I touched on that already. He knew everything about you. That's because my thing went back up. That's what it was. All right, we're going to come in right here at the um, Climbing the Ladder. Climbing the Ladder is this little page on, 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 on number 13. Yeah. <laughs> See, Jesus knew who he was. He didn't try to be anything else or be, be anybody else, and therefore he was able to fulfill his purpose. When you know who you are, you can uh, identify what your purpose is. You can identify where you're supposed to be. When you know who you are, you will value who you are, and you won't let anybody else disvalue who you are. And in order for people not to disvalue you, you've got to know why things bother you the way that they bother you, why things are the way they are, and why you're not going to let them be the way that they are. You've got to come to that point of having honest conversations with people. But before you do that, you've got to climb this ladder of integrity first. You've got to go from the bottom all the way to the top, 
alone to make sure that before you try to go to someone that you've already made sure that you searched your own heart out and make sure that these things, there it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and that all of those things are already settled in you before you try to go to somebody else because the problem may not be them. It might just very well be you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Okay, read all of them. See, Deacon Charles, I mean, Minister Charles, half the seat. <laughs> all right, number one, right now the issue on my mind is, number two, I'm anxious in talking about this because, three, my part in this is, four, my need in this issue is, five, my feelings about this are, six, what my reaction tells me about me is. Seven, this issue is important to me because I value. That's what we were talking about. What do you value? If you value time spent alone, do you don't let people monopolize your time, but be honest with them about it. Don't get mad with them because they don't respect your time if you're not going to walk in integrity to tell them that you like time alone. That's just your time. Okay, I'm going on. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and I violate that value when? I am willing and not willing to. One thing I could do to improve the situation is, the most important thing I want you to know is, I think my honest sharing will benefit our relationship by, and number 12, I hope and look forward to. See, the end result should always be about the healing. It should always be about reconciliation. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Can I just ask you this question real quick, Pastor? Yeah. If I can find my question. I just want to leave you with this one question. And it says, here are some signs that you are living a divided life without integrity. This was our intent is to be whole. That was the integrity part. We care too much what others think. We spin the truth, exaggerate, or lie to make ourselves look better. We blame others rather than take responsibility for our words and actions. We avoid confrontation. We say yes when we prefer to say no. Amen. Amen. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to combine the last two because our time is getting, is gone. The question and answer session took, session took a lot more time than what we thought it would, but that's okay. And of those that still have questions, once we end, we'll have our question and answer session after we end. Um, and then, um, but if you need to leave, you can, okay? So I'm going to try to combine both. All right, now that we've gotten to the point, uh, to this point, uh, number seven, this is the seventh session. This session is going to deal with fighting cleanly. Uh, and that's on page 14. All right. So we've come down the, uh, the process and we've got our temperature. We've, we found out what our temperature was. Okay. What is it that uh, is really going on with me in these relationships? Praise God. Uh, relationship with God and relationship with people. And I'm going to stop mind reading. I'm going to stop just trying to assume that I know what's going on with people because they act a certain way. Right. I'm going to take the time and I'm going to ask questions. I notice and uh, uh, help me to understand, right? We're going to find out what's going on. And then we're going to genogram our family to make sure that there's not something about me that repulses people, right? There may be something about, it may not be the other people. It may be something in me that I'm not aware of because I pray and I ask God and, he, you know, I think he's shown me everything, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to genogram my family to see what attributes, what characteristics, what iniquities, what bent that may be going on and that, that may be transferred unto me that I'm not knowledgeable of because I know I got power and victory of it and Jesus freed me from it, but I may still be walking in it because that's how I was nurtured. I was nurtured the wrong way. So you could be nurtured the right way or nurtured the wrong way. So I was nurtured the wrong way, and so that thing is still operating in me unconsciously, right? So we're going to gender grandma, and then we're going to explore the iceberg. We're going to make sure, you know, that, uh, you know, what's deep down, you know, because sometimes I'm just looking at the surface of things, but what's going on deep within me? Right? Because I want to be meat for the master's use. And so in order to be meat for the master's use, I got to find out what's really going on deep within me. And then, and then I want to be able, once I diagnose myself and get a good, good understanding of me uh, exploring the iceberg, 
I'm going to let God just melt it on down because I'm going to sit, sit with him. And I'm going to let him just minister to me and deal with me. Amen. About me. Release everybody else and let him just have his way with me. And that way I'll be free to listen incarnationally. Right? Because I can't listen incarnationally when I'm all built up with stuff going on in my life. I need to be uh, uh, free so I can be that person for other people. You know, when other people that are going through what I've gone through or maybe something I've never gone through, they need someone to talk to. And I need to be able to hear, praise God, and not just listen. Right? I need to be able to hear their hearts, hear their pain, connect with them so they know that somebody can cares. But I can't do that if I'm all built up myself. You know, I may be able to listen, and I listen to people all the time, but do you really hear what people are saying? And then, as I do that, I'm going to climb the ladder, uh, ladder of integrity as well, because there's going to be some situations I got to confront, right? There's no way around it. I got to deal with some things, but before I go deal with that situation, I'm going to take the time to climb the ladder of integrity to really find out where am I really at in this, right? Why does this really bug me, right? I'm going to take, before I go and deal with that person, why am I so bothered by this? And I want to make sure that, I'm, uh, that, that, that my bother, what bothers me so much is not because of something that's still active in me, right? And so then, but, but, but once I've done all that, it's time to fight. Somebody took me and they said, it's time to fight. We finally ready to fight. All right? Who's ready to fight? It's gone. Let's do this. You know what? We did everything we can do. Now it's time to fight. But we can't just fight any kind of way. We got to fight clean. Amen. We got to fight clean. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> going straight to what it said, most Christians, most Christians we meet are poor at resolving conflict. There, at least, there are at least two reasons for this. Here's number one. Wrong beliefs about peacemaking. These are Christians. This ain't about the world. Now. This is all us, Christian, the church. And, you know, we got a wrong belief about peacemaking. Number two, a lack of training and equipping in this area. That's why we're here today, to get us equipped. Amen? So Jesus did not call us to be pacifiers and appeasers. All right? Goes back to what uh, Angela was saying. You know, we, we're not be people pleasers. We got to be God pleasers. And are we pleasing God with how we're handling our relationships? And God ain't just, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. J jump on me, knock me out, kill me, and stunt me. And I'm, ju I'm just a Jesus child. That's not how God is, right? Because you ain't helping nobody being that way. You know, and so uh, Jesus did not call us to be pacifiers and appeasers who ensure that nobody gets upset. We become false peacemakers when we're that kind of person. When, uh, when out of fear, out of fear, and sometimes it's because of ignorance, we just don't know how to handle it the right way. So it's not always bad, but when out of fear, we avoid conflict and we appease people. We allow people to stay in error when we know that they need help, they need deliverance, and we just appease, try to appease them. We should not ignore difficult issues and problems in an effort to make sure that things remain stable and serene because it's a false stability. It's a false serenity because really in your heart, you don't even want to see them coming, right? Really in your heart, you don't want to be around them or really in your heart, you know what I mean? And God is always about our heart and he wants our heart to always be tender, to always be pure. He tells us to guard our hearts with all diligence. Well, how are you going to guard your heart when you're allowing stuff to defile your heart against your brother or your sister, right? So you have to deal with it God's way. Now, number one, see, I'm moving quick. True peace will never come through pretending what is right is what is wrong is right. We got to stop pretending. No more do we pretend that Zion Christian Center, the culture has shifted. If it ain't all right, we got to get deal with it, work with it until it is all right. And that is all right genuinely, not fake, right? And so truth, tr uh, so we'll never come through pretending what is wrong is right. True peacemakers, you can write this down, love God. True peacemakers. We don't want to be false peacemakers. We're going to be true peacemakers. True peacemakers love God, they love others, and get this one, and you got to love yourself. So the, all them first six sessions was getting us to get self straight, right? All right? Love yourself and to, enough to put aside false peace. Because the reason why a lot of times we, we, we're people pleasers is because that makes us feel good about ourselves. You know? 
We want, but you ought to already know who you are and already feel good about yourself. So whether somebody else feel good about you or not, I love it. I love you. I, I'd like for everybody to like me. But if you don't, I know who I am. It don't take away from who I am. Pray. I am. I got you. I saw all that. Okay, we got it. But um, true peacemakers <laughs> desire the peace of Christ's kingdom. Write this one down. True peacemakers desire the peace of Christ's kingdom more than walking in lies and pretense. Because when you're a false peacemaker, that's what you're walking in, lies and pretense. True peacemakers desire the peace of Christ's kingdom to be flowing through them more than walking in lies and pretense. We wanted the Bible, so we want all things added to us, but are we seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness? And if we're not walking in love towards our brothers and our sisters, we're not. And we wonder why the things ain't coming in. I'm tithing, I'm doing all these other things. things was, okay, here's it, right here, right here. Check it out. Unanswered prayers. Some of us got years or our life of built up stuff in our spirit against others. And it can literally abort the plan of God for our lives. I'm telling you it can. Because what he's entrusting you to may be dependent upon your ability to deal with people. Well, if that's your destiny and you've not allowed him to work through you, the ability to deal with people, how are you going to walk through that? Amen. How are you going to walk in it? Does that make sense? Amen. All right, so true. here's the third one. True, true peacemakers are willing to confront difficult issues. True peacemakers are willing to confront difficult issues and problems in order to truly connect with others. They're willing to confront it in order to truly connect with others. Because the problems, no, this is just me, because the problems and the conflicts and difficult issues don't just go away. Oh, get the mic. You always have a say whenever you want to say it. No, no, I was just <laughs> simply saying as, as we was preparing this year for connect, it was another word he gave me was confront. Uh, it, was to, it was to me first. And sometimes we can't connect because we won't confront. But once you confront, it opens the door for connection. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it just that wall just stays there, you know, if we don't confront some things. That's good, Pastor. Mm -hmm. And unresolved conflicts are one of the greatest tensions in Christian lives today. Unresolved conflicts. Can y'all can y'all agree, amen? Unresolved conflict is one of the greatest tensions. And the enemy, what, has, has his way in churches. Churches fill up and empty out, fill up and empty, empty out. You, even to some of these mega churches, I hear, listen to some of those pastors, they say, but we got, it's like a revolving door. People coming in and going out all the time. Why? Because issues aren't resolved. People aren't connecting. You know, people don't feel part of a, the family of Christ. You're right? They don't stick it out. They don't feel bound uh, committed and covenant with one another, Angela. They don't feel, so it's like, I can do with you, I can do without you. I'm gone. That's the mentality. That's not God's way. It causes this defensiveness, reactivity, being very, because uh, we become very uh, sensitive. People can't talk to you about nothing, can't, can't correct you about nothing, because you just get towed up, right? Uh, let's look at uh, Fighting tactics on the next page. Dirty fighting tactics. Here's the tactics that we fight. We fighting. We're fighting, but we're fighting in a way uh, uh, subliminal, subliminally. And here's what some of them is. And, and you can check beside which one might be you. Give you. I'm fighting you, but I'm fighting you by giving you the silent treat. I'm fighting, but I'm going to lecture you in my fight. I'm fighting you, but I'm blaming and attacking you. Or I'm uh, condescension, putting you down, I'm threatening gestures. You know, kind of mm. name calling, criticizing. You f this dirty fighting though. This ain't clean fight. <laughs> Complaining, <laughs> denying. Uh uh. No no. Uh uh. You, I'm rolling over. You, you, no uh uh. Not tonight. Walking away. Walking away, just walk away while somebody's crying out and trying to share their heart, and you just walk away. Placate, pretending, avoiding. Well, I, uh uh, I ain't even gonna be around. I, I know why they sit on this side of church. I'm gonna sit on the other side. I'm just gonna avoid them today. Shouting, 
That's kind of what I grew up. We just shout it out. <laughs> you out of stain? Shout it out. Want to get a tough, tough stain out? <laughs> but you know what? We verbalized. We communicated. We ain't had no communicating issues. That's why Danny married a woman that ain't had no communicating issues. I just told you how I feel. My, did my mama tell you how she felt? You knew how Martha Terry felt at all times and always. He married Martha's daughter. Amen. Ladies, y'all ain't got to always tell us how you feel. You don't have to always Not tell always. us how you feel. Uh, you just... uh, okay. Anger and rage. Using the word always. Lord, I used to do that. Dan said, I know I don't always. We've come a long way. You don't never. Teresa, I know sometimes I do. Uh, anger and rage. Anger and rage. Passive aggressive behavior. Lying. Hitting and violence. Showing contempt and sarcasm. These are ways that we dirty fight, okay? Conflict is normal, important, and, that, and see, some of these may be generational. You, you grew up with it. See, I had to change that because Danny won't go shout back, right? So I had to change that. I had to change that about me. I grew up, and that's how we did it. The tension was gone after we got through, you know, doing that. But that wasn't what he grew up with. And so we had to change. In the body of Christ, we had to change. Conflict is normal, important, and necessary. If relationships are, are to enter their next level of growth and maturity, conflict is necessary. Here's a clean fighting process, and I'm having to go through it quickly. You got to have time, like what Ms. Uh, Ms. Gentry asked that question. If you tried and you tried to reach out to them, you've tried the uh, thermometer, uh, you took the temperature reading, you, 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 I appreciate you, I'm going to give you a gift, you're important to me, uh, you know, I'm puzzled about why you know uh, we're not having the same type of interaction like we used to. I notice you, you do all that and then they still got something going on. You're going to need to sit down and say, we need to talk, right? And, 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 and as you the speaker, you're sharing with them how you feel. But if they don't want to listen, you're going to have to immediately bring somebody else in. Because, and if they haven't gone through this, see, all of us in here, we would know to sit down and listen. But if they haven't, everybody that you come across haven't gone through this. But if it's somebody in the body of Christ, somebody on your team, somebody you uh, on your job or whatever, you have to sit down and try to talk it through. That if, but if they're not a Christian, you can't expect them to do this. So this is written for us believers. So you sit down and you ask for permission to do a clean fight. Can I do a clean fight? Husband and wives, sisters and brothers in Christ, can we do a clean fight? All right? And then the listener, remember, you got to listen. You got to hear. I'm sorry. You got to hear what they're saying. Am I saying that right? You got to hear what's being said. You got to have an ear to hear. So, and, and one way you know you hear, repeat back what they said. Not verbatim, but kind of sum it up. If, I, if I'm saying, you know, you know, can we do a clean fight? Okay. All right. We want, to resolve, we want to resolve that. We want the blessings of God to flow in both our lives. Yes, we do. All right, we're going to do a clean fight. All right, okay, I notice it, it's, it's, it seems that you're still avoiding me, and, and I don't understand why. And when you do that, it really uh, hurts, hurts my heart because I remember the relationship that we used to have, right? And then the listener will say, okay, so what you're saying is you desire the same type of relationship we used to have, and... You, you, you feel like I'm avoiding you. Yeah. See, that helps the speaker know that you heard them. Does that make sense? You ain't got to say every word they said, but it lets them know you heard my heart. Okay? Then the speaker said, then you state the problem, which I kind of went a little bit ahead of things. Y'all know I always do that. So notice, express how things seem to you. You can write that beside that. I notice. So express how things seem to you. It may be wrong, as Ms. Ms. Uh, Priscilla said. The way you may be assuming, uh, but you don't want to assume, so you're going to sit down and you're going to talk to them, right? And then state why is it important to you. Now you've got to be able to contact your feelings. That's why you need to go back to that feeling sheet. It's okay. You've got to be vulnerable. You've got to let down that wall and say, I need this, right? I value our relationship because be open about your feelings. It's going to take a little time, but hey, that's what we got to get. Fill in the following sentence. Uh, when you do this and this, I feel this and this. Use the feeling words, okay? Go back to that feeling word list. When you turn and walk away or when I speak to you and you don't speak back, <laughs> I feel, okay? State your request clearly, respectfully, and 
specifically, no, not with a blaming attitude, but clearly, including details such as times and dates. That's why, Saints, when you're working on a team, working on a team, you and a, and a team member uh, does something to bother you, you're responsible by God to go to them because you've got the time and the date that this happened. Now, if I'm, if 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 if, uh, if, if it's somebody on the praise team and they do it to another member on the praise team, the praise team need to go to each other before they bring that thing to me. Because if they bring it to me, then it's hearsay. Am I making sense? It's hearsay. So I'm getting knowledge from you that you haven't even told that person. So guess what they're saying? Y'all talking about me. Y'all gossiping about me. Right? So you got to go to that person to wipe that thing out and say, look, this is, this is, this is. And if that person don't change or they act like they don't hear you, then you come. I'm talking, I'm saying praise team. Praise, then the praise team members come to me. And then I sit down with the both of them. Does that make sense? That's God's order. It's biblical, guys. It's the Bible. It's just the Bible in the hand. And so after the day, we all going to do things the Bible way. Amen? And then the listener, to show that you've listened, because whatever they're saying, you're kind of, you're kind of paraphrasing and saying it back, then you're going to consider the request. Right? They're going to briefly share your feelings and perspective on it. So if they're requesting that, you know, that we, that we try to get back at least to having some level of uh, uh, camaraderie with one another, that we we'll at least try to speak to each other, you know, we'll be cordial with one another, and that we'll pray for one another. Let's just say if that's, those are the things that I as a speaker want the listener to do. And they're going to consider. And brief share that feels, well, I don't know if I want <laughs> us to even be cordial no more. Be real. Because you don't know how you hurt me. I'm just talking church. I'm talking church. You don't know how you hurt me. And I don't know if I'm ready. Right? We got to deal with that. So where, 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 so where do we go from here? Well, there's some healing that's needed. But can we agree upon you seeking healing and we both seeking healing? Married couples. This is a good married couple thing. You know what I mean? Right? We still together. Bodies still in the same house, but we're in separate bedrooms or on the edges of the bed. All right? They ain't been with each other in three months. Why? Because I need healing. So let's seek some counseling. You know, let's seek some, let's seek some counseling. Are you willing to do that? See, we've found the root of it. Now, the speaker agree on the modified request, uh, the one with the problem, and then keep going back and forth. Do y'all see that? And then it says write out an agreement, which is kind of good. It can be brief, but it kind of helps to make sure, okay, this is what we agreed upon, and, and when we, one goes another way, you can bring it back. Okay, look, we agreed upon this. Yeah, right. All right, real quick, developing a rule of life, and we're done. All right? It's very important to order your life in such a way that you will intentionally pay attention to God and remember him in all we do. We got to do this intentionally. However, this is no small task. Our cram schedules, and, and, there, and Father Christ said, some of you itching right now because it's past 1 o'clock and you're supposed to be going to do something. Our endless to-do list, don't blame, blame us. We was good. It's the question, the question people. They couldn't know this song. <laughs> I'm just trying to take it off of us. <laughs> I'm trying to take it off of us. But we love the questions was needed. So no, nobody, yeah, they were good. It's just, it's just part of it. Amen. Um, but how this is no small task. Our cram schedules, endless to-do lists, demanding jobs and families, noisy surroundings. You're talking about quiet time of God, and you're like, where am I finding that? In the bathroom, lock the door. You that have children, lock the door. They're going to be at the door knocking and scratching and all, but after a while, they'll get quiet. Put some cookies or something in the other room. <laughs> Eat your cookies, boy. Flashbacks. I'm having flashbacks. All of them at the door. Chill, they even at the door. They grown now. I'm sorry. I had a flashback. I did. I had to put stuff out there outside the door. Just, I did. I'm back. I'm back. And t- Jesus. Whew. 
Ah. So, all these anxieties keep us from actually making the changes we desire. We want this to be a rule of life, a rule of life to walk with God and to do things God's way. It's got to be a rule of our life, intentionally spend time with God, intentionally be still and silent before God so that he can give you the experience like he did Isaiah. You know, and Isaiah was able to say, woe is me, and, and then he can come and he can purge you and saturate you and burn. We got to be still and silent for God to do all of that because we got to get before and see he's so great he's so magnificent he's so powerful he's greater than this thing that I'm going through than this thing that I'm feeling and I'm not going to let you go till you bless me oh God I'm not going to let you go till you free me oh God I don't want to keep living like this this is not the way Jesus did and so we got to just get to the place where the most important rule is to be with God and to love him and that circumstances don't dictate my love and my joy and peace in God. Number one, what negative impact does the demands of the present day and culture have on Christians today? Here's one thing. It gets us unfocused. The, our culture and the demands of our present day gets us unfocused and distracted and spiritually adrift. Adrift means we're failing to reach the target that God has called us to reach yes. in the body of Christ. Yes. We should be rich by now, wealthy. Yes. We should be healthy. Yes. We should be walking in fullness and of God. We should be hearing from God like Mr. Minister Monica was saying, what God can download. We should be downloaded. But when your, when your emotions are tied up, you don't hear the downloads. And you're wondering why I'm not being blessed financially because you can't hear the downloads. We want to fix it by just doing the doing, and the doing you ought to do, but you can't, can't neglect justice, God's justice. And his justice is found in the two laws. Every justice system has laws. Loving God, loving your neighbor. You've omitted loving your neighbor. You've omitted loving God like you should, and you have not. Uh, 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 oh, Jesus, Jesus. Those are the way that matters. But don't leave that other part undone either. But it ain't just in that other part. And that's what the, the enemy has, has, has made our society like this on purpose. It was really against the Christians so that we can't get in the battlefield and do what we're supposed to be do and be lights in this dark world. And he tried to keep us fighting each other so that we don't have what we need to go out and fight the devil. So what is the rule of life and how can we implement it? Luke 14, 25 through 30. Pastor, could you please read that and then we close it. Luke 14, 25 through 30. Because this says supposed to be me and Pastor together, but we ran out of time. So he told me, go on up there and do it. <laughs> 25 through 30. There's a cost for discipleship. Pastor has been preaching every Wednesday night, teaching us on discipleship. We are disciples. Zion Christian Center, not just a church of, of, of Christians per se, believers per se, we're just, but we are disciples. We're followers after Christ. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, we have been doing this on Wednesday night. Uh, and it begins at uh, the cost of discipleship. And that went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said to them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. Which means, you know, don't put him before me. That's right. That's all it is. 27, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counted the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? That's happily after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, finish it. All that behold it begin to mock him. Uh, now, what was I supposed to go to? Third. Okay. Oh, I'm done. Okay. All right. But you know what? Can you finish the rest of it? Because all of it is good. Or what king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else while the, the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desireth conditions um, of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, 
for men cast it out. And he that has is to hear. Let him hear. Let him hear. Do you see what he's saying? There's a cost, guys. We got to hate mother, father, sister, brother, wife, all of, and children. Not hate meaning hate them per, per se as anger. and But we've got a, the priority relationship. The priority relationship is not them. It's God. That's what he means. Your priorities, our priorities in the body of Christ is twisted. God is the priority. So hate is figuratively saying you've got to make sure everything comes under this. So how you deal with each other is based on how you deal with God. And then you got to count up the cost. It's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you your life. But once you lay down this life that you had for all these years that's connected to your genogram, you're going to experience the new life that Christ died for you to have. And it's so much freer. How can you be in a relationship that is not producing what you want but yet still have peace? It's because of the priority life. The priority life gives you peace even in storms. But is he priority? And so, and this, this is what it says, count up the cost, guys. We don't want to build the kingdom of God haphazardly. You know, when people see us, are we building the kingdom on a solid foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the one, he is the chief cornerstone, and he's helping us, showing us how to build, because I'm spending stillness and quietness with him, and he's revealing to me how to build. I'm spending time in his word, and he's revealing, and, and guess what? I'm not an option. I'm not an option. He's the only option. So God, your word said, and so I'm going to get this straight. There's no other option. That's right. That's right. I feel like I don't want to, and I feel anxious about that. Why? And then he's going to tell you why. Well, this is why you're feeling anxious. That's right. That's right. And then not only that, a king is going to ask you before he go to war, listen, are you going to fight against God? God is the king of all kings. And when we choose not to do things God's way, we're saying, God, I ain't doing things. I'm doing my own thing. You fighting God. That's exactly right. You're not winning. <laughs> Turn your neighbor and say, you're not winning. <laughs> I'm just telling you that right now. You're not winning. You know? And because God designed us to be salt on the earth. That's right. Salt preserves. Salt adds flavor. Salt just does a whole lot of things. But if you have lost your saltiness because you ain't going to do things God's way, what good are you? That's what, he's saying. what good are you to the kingdom? And guess what? Doors are wide open for the enemy to come in and attack you however he wants to. So true. Because you know to do right, but you refuse to do it. Yeah. He didn't know what to do. And do it not, you're actually sinning. So sin is the curse. I said sin is the curse. When you operate in sin, then your wealth is stolen from you because you refuse to obey the word of God with your neighbor. Yeah. You refuse to do the word of God with God. Yes. Do y'all yes. understand? So yes. this is a rule of life. We have to intentionally say, God, your word is your word. I'm going to do the word. Yes. yes. No if, ands, buts about it. Yes. Man, won't you bet, man? But, yes. you know, Y'all see, because I get too serious. I be trying to throw a humor in there. Y'all don't catch it. No, you don't. <laughs> Praise God. And that's my, that's my conclusion <laughs> of the Amen. whole matter. I tell you, that was some kind of conclusion. Hey. Man, I thought we were going to take it up Pastor off Johnson, there for a hey? well, I don't have anything. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for all these uh, presenters today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you guys, was awesome. Amen. This was awesome. Amen. Thank you guys for coming today. I do uh, just want to conclude with saying let's take what we've heard and, um, and utilize it. Because back, back to what we're saying about the spiritual family and the natural family. You know, one thing about growing up with siblings, how many know, you know, you can fight and fuss and, and have a knockdown, drag out and all that. But guess what? You're going to go to bed in that same house that night and you're going to get up the next day and y'all right back to playing and, 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 and carrying on and stuff like that. So, um, okay, okay, yes, ma'am, okay. So, um, so, so we're going we're gonna to prepare to dismiss, but I do want to say use this on your teams, team leaders. Use this with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Once again, we, we shouldn't have a problem with, um, you know, conflict. You know, I mean, this was great conflict resolution is what I'm saying, and healthy emotions, talking things out. And this is really sometimes difficult for men. 
to, to discuss how they feel. You know, because we just, that's something most men just not accustomed to doing. You know, when we talk, you know, instead of talking about football and soft or whatever, you know, we go, man, how you feel, man? Oh, man, I'm, I'm feeling a little fuzzy. You know, we just, we just don't usually talk about how we feel. So, fellas, we want to, we got we to gotta tighten up on that, okay? Greg, you need to tell me how you feel, man. Amen. Praise God. You know, if you're feeling mighty low, just say it. Amen. <laughs> But um, so we're going to work on that. We're going to work on that. And uh, if you, we got some more stuff to hand out. What is that? Can they give them out in the, in the foyer or whatever? We just wait. We just, yeah. Or, or at the back door. Yes. Now, we, now, if you have to leave, that's fine. Uh, but if you have questions, we'll take a couple of questions if, if you got questions. 